Uh, and so this series that, that we are talking about um, next probably three to four weeks is uh, called The Ideal Church, The Ideal Church. Um, and it's uh, labeled that way specifically uh, because we are going to be talking about um, relationships and engagement and community and, and all the stuff, the expectations that we have, all the stuff with all the Fs you can have, stuff. When it comes to the church, all the stuff we're talking about, how do I engage with people? What do I, what do I need to expect when I come into the church? What, what should I expect? How, how are we to relate to one another as members of the body of Jesus? Like we walk into the church and we have a certain set of expectations on there's two songs and a message and more two songs and then we're going to release the greed and all these things. But, but more than that... We're not talking about expectations for what the service will look like. We're talking about expectations for how we relate to one another as the family of God and friends of one another. And that's really, really important to me. Uh, This is personal to me, and it should be personal to you, uh, because we are not just in a season, I think this has always been this way, uh, but I've I've heard it more and seen it the last few years, where people close to me in this church for the last six, seven years of being here, or people that I know outside of other churches, uh, they have... Um, started to question their need for the church. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to engage in a church. I can follow Jesus on my own. It's a lot easier. I'm so busy, I can follow Jesus on my own. I don't need to be a part of things. And, um, and so we want to talk about what it looks like uh, from a perspective of relating and how there is a need, uh, but the need might be different. The expectation might be different. So, so the goal of this series, just to frame our time around the next few weeks, is really just a simple hope that I have in a prayer when it comes to thinking about how to uh, think biblically about the church. I want to set realistic and biblical expectations for the family of God. Really important. That word is really important. Uh, Biblical and realistic. Biblical and realistic. Because we are entering into community, you may enter into today, and you have a, a group of expectations that are, some are biblical, some are realistic, and some are worldly and personal, and some are unrealistic, as in like they will probably never be met, but yet we hold to them as hoping they will be met. And here's what I know about expectations in marriage. Let me speak for my own marriage and probably your marriage or your relationship. If you're single, you know from relationships that when you have unrealistic expectations, especially when you don't communicate these expectations, They will become unmet expectations. And when you deal with unmet expectations, what happens? You get disappointed. You get disappointed. You get disillusioned with things or with your partner or with a relationship because you expected things to go one way. They went completely opposite that you expected. And so you're thinking there's an issue to things. We all feel it with the church. There's no one in here that, has, that, has, that hasn't felt this sense of disillusionment. When you look around, I mean, the, the idea of disillusionment, the, the, the definition is simply to, to expect things and, and to see things and go, wow, that wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. You're disillusioned. You're frustrated. You see a gap between what you want to, to, to be real and what is real. And in that gap, we often um, find ourselves in a point of, let down. This is not what I thought church relationships would be. This is not what I thought my, squ- my small group would be. This is not what I thought the pastor would act like. This is not what I thought the church would emphasize. This is not what I thought we would do things. Every single one of us. And I don't think it's even a, um, a inherently wrong thing because we are people that have ideas and visions and values and we bring those to the table. But there's something that happens that we want to make sure to uh, check with, with the scriptures to see what kind of expectations are we bringing into the community uh, and what expectations do we need to trade in and say these are mine and they're not healthy and I need to trade in expectations with what the Bible says so that I'm not just not disappointed, but I actually can function properly in the church. We're not just trying to guard against disappointment. We're trying to actually step into the reality that God has for us as people of Jesus. And if you're here with me or online and you follow Jesus, you're a disciple of him, you have the spirit of God in you, you are born again, then it's not a preference whether you get to interact with the body of Jesus. It is a a command. And if you want to see it differently, it is a blessing. 
it is a privilege and an opportunity to get to be side by side with the people of God that I don't want to rock your boat, but you're going to spend eternity with these people. Look around. You're like, these people? These people that love Jesus, eternity with them. So if we're going to spend eternity with them then, then we have this sense of value of the present relationship now that we want to grow. I want to bring up one of my um, friends. We never met because he uh, had passed away before I was ever born. But I consider him a friend because, I don't know why you're laughing, but um, all my authors that I read, I consider them friends. Uh, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. I've read a lot of his work and studied his life. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, born 1906, uh, assassinated, or I guess you can say um, killed and murdered 1945 uh, by the Nazis because of a planned assassination attempt on Hitler. But he also was a German Lutheran pastor. Uh, he was part of the Confessing Church that uh, was kind of an underground church in Germany because the state church had been corrupted by Germany and the Nazis. And so he was trying to start a different church or have this kind of different lane of the church that still stayed faithful to Jesus while times were being compromised. And I want to bring this up because what we're going to read the next few moments is, is um, a couple quotes that he wrote in a book called Life Together. This book is, is very uh, special. Uh, but it's special because he writes this book, Life Together, out of an experience of him starting an underground seminary, basically, where he started training pastors, the people to be pastors, while uh, the Nazis were training just a, uh, a mile away their own soldiers. And he was training these men to be pastors and training these people to learn how to live in community in one home together, praying together, serving together. And after they got shut down and most of them got thrown in jail before he got assassinated or killed, he wrote this book in his parents' house when he went to go live there called Life Together. And he says this. It has everything to do with what we're talking about now. He says, a great disillusionment, what we just talked about, the letdown, with others, with Christians in general, and if we're fortunate with ourselves, is bound to overwhelm us as surely as God desires to lead us to an understanding of genuine Christian community. Let's just stop there. You can go back. He's saying the disillusionment that we feel that this is not the way it should be. I thought church was going to be different. I thought relationships were going to be different. He says that is a gift from God that we had disillusionment with the church, with Christians, even with ourselves, because God desires to lead us into an authentic and real sense of community. He goes on to say, by sheer grace, God will not permit, oh, this is so good, God will not permit us to live in a dream world even for a few weeks and to abandon ourselves to those blissful experiences and exalted moods that sweep over us like a wave of rapture. For God is not a God of emotionalism, but the God of truth. Saying God's, not, God's so kind to you, he's not going to let you live in this dream world where la di la this is perfect, everything is the way I want it to be. He's going to come down and he's going to crash that party sooner than later because he wants you to live in the real world, not the dream world. And there's moments where church and life and the community is going to feel like this is heaven. And there's moments where you're going to feel like this is not heaven. There's moments where you're going to feel like this is everything I thought it was going to be and more. And then there's moments going to be like, is this even Christian? What's the difference between this and the world? And I say that is a beautiful thing because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that is not yet remade. And God needs to crash us, uh, our expectations, so he does not allow us to live in this dream world thinking everything is perfectly going to happen the way we want it to. He goes on to say this. The sooner this moment of disillusionment comes over the individual and the community, the better for both. However, this is a warning he gives. A community that cannot bear and cannot survive such disillusionment, clinging instead to its idealized images, loses at the same time the promise of a durable Christian community. Just stay right there, bro. 
So you start with this illusionment, the, the, the letdown happens. This is not the way I thought it was going to be. This pastor, I wish he was like this. He's too loud. He talks too fast, whatever. He's too energetic. This person, he's like this, and I wish this person would meet me because I'm an introvert, and this person's not meeting me where I'm at. This group doesn't understand my preference. All these things that we want and desire, he's saying that needs to happen, and, and the, the, the warning he gives is that a community will break down if we hold on to the idealized image of things that we want to happen, things that we hope to happen, things that we say this is how community should be like, and never enter into the reality of the mess that God has us walking into, which is also a beautiful thing because it's walking with the people of God. He has to shatter that. Now, this next slide, this next line is like the thesis of this whole series. Those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that community. I want to read that again. Those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself, those who love what should happen, what they expect to happen more than actually what is happening to people right in front of them, they become not even intentionally, but they become destroyers of that community. When we hold on to the idealized image of what a community should be based on our preferences and our opinions and our wants and needs, and we don't let that go, we actually end up destroying the authentic experience of community that God wants us to have to one another. Here's the big problem, just set up in a very simple sentence. Our unrealistic expectations of the church are killing our experiences in the church. It doesn't mean it's like killed it for good. It's, it's ruining it. It's tainting the experience. Our unrealistic expectations are actually affecting your experience. And I want to, to reveal this to us because sometimes we just look at the experience and say, this is not good. I don't like this. And we don't understand without moving backwards and pausing that maybe it's not. The problem isn't the church. The problem is my expectations. Now, I'm not saying our church is perfect or the church is perfect. What I am saying is, what if we started asking the question alongside the other questions we're asking? What if all the problems I'm feeling, the frustrations, are not fully on the church because they're not doing things the way I want them to do, but on my expectations of what they should be doing? Uh-oh. What happens when the question actually is real and authentic and the answer actually challenges us? Do we open up to the idea? How does this happen? How do we end up destroying the community that Bonhoeffer says we do? He goes on to say this, and this is the end of the quote. Those who dream of this idealized community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others, and by themselves. They enter the community of Christians with their demands, whether we say it or not, set up their own law, and judge one another and even God accordingly. He goes on to say, they act as if they have to create the Christian community. As if their visionary ideal binds the people together. This is so important. Whatever does not go their way, they call a failure. And when their idealized image is shattered, they see the community breaking into pieces. I've talked to so many people over the last six, seven years of being at the movement that have left um, or become jaded. Not because what they experienced was like, irregular in the church. But because of this, they thought something was wrong with the community at large. Everything was broken because it wasn't, it wasn't um, the experience they wanted it to be. And it break, broke my heart that I've seen people not only leave Jesus, uh, the church, but leave walking with Jesus because of their disillusionment with his people. So this is a serious joyful but serious thing that we want to slow down to think through because the Bible has things to say about this. Um, here's the breakdown, just to logically walk through this. We all have an idealized image of community. We judge our experiences by those expectations. We become dis disillusioned when they aren't met, and then we think something is wrong with the church. And when I say church, I'm not even particularly talking about the organization or the leadership. I'm talking about just the people in general. It's funny, I've heard people uh, recently, the last two years of being here, uh, last year of leading the church, that it's funny, people who are involved, I, I'm not going to uh, name names, but I've heard people, uh, um, even when I was a different pastor at a different church, they would say, I want to leave this church, and we would ask them, why, why? we, we want to bless you if you want to go somewhere that God wants you to go, but why do you want to leave this church? And, um, 
it was always it seemed to always be that people are not living up to my expectations on what it should look like. Like, like nine out of ten, it was always sometimes like Tom and Jennifer. They are moving because God has called them. We've talked to them. They've seen it. They even said, we don't even want to serve sometimes, but they're coming. They're giving their all. They're, they're serving. That's a different kind of move we want people to make. But I don't, I, it breaks my heart that people move away from the church because they look at it and it doesn't line up with our idea. Now, let's look at this next slide. I want to label. This is a long list. It could have been longer. I want to label some of the things that we would never say but write down as our dream community. These are probably unsaid, unspoken, but deep down lodged into our soul and our mind, our psyche of things that we would expect to experience in the church. Let's go through them. Number one, the expectation that we have, I will get along with everyone in the same way. The people that I'm with, I'm going to get along with them in the same way. They're all Christians. They all have the spirit of God. I'm going to get along with them in the same way that I get along with my best friend who's right next to me or who's my best friend who's not in this church. I'm going to get along with them the same way. Number two, people will be my best friends. It's funny that I've talked to so many people, um, and not so many people, but there's a number of people, a handful of people I've talked to that have a struggle with interacting with the church inside and outside this church uh, because they're, they're gauging it on their relationship with their best friends outside the church. And they're mapping their relationship with their best friends has to be exactly the same as those with the church. Is, is that what we should have as an expectation? Number three, there should be no problems or conflict. None of us would say this, but we enter in, and when there's a problem and a conflict, we're like, what's wrong? This is the church of Jesus. It should be like Jesus-y. And we're like, we, we stutter and stumble when we interact with conflict or Even scandals. It breaks my heart that there's scandals in the church of Jesus. Different denominations, different leaders. I, I've known leaders that dropped because of their scandals. But you know what? I want you. To, I want to pass this on to you. Um, I am brokenhearted over the scandals. I am not surprised by them. Why am I not surprised and why you shouldn't be surprised? You should be brokenhearted, but you shouldn't be surprised. Because people still have a sinful flesh they are struggling to war against. If you don't think you have a flesh that's sinful after you've been saved, then you, re- then you have to take out so much of the Bible that says, make war against your sin. Or like Romans, kill your sin with the Spirit of God. Or like Galatians 5, you have the Spirit and the flesh and they're at war with each other. And some people just stop making war against their flesh and their flesh wins. And that's not because the church is at fault or the church is messed up. It's because the church is still filled with broken people. And it breaks my heart, but it's a reality that we deal with problems and conflict. It should be less than the world, but they're still going to happen. Number four, people will see things the way I see them. I see things a certain way, the- theologically or, or politically or mentally, whatever. And people should see things the way I see them. The leadership will do what I want and like. No one's ever said that. Well, that was a joke. I mean, no one has ever said that, but people have acted like that a lot. <laughs> the leadership, I've been in churches where I'm like, man, I want the leadership to do something that I want to like, and they're not doing what I want to like. Uh, the, style, the style of things will be what I enjoy the most. Hmm. Like Tom said, man, the parking is good. The, the style of worship, I've been in churches where I'm like, yeah, their worship, a little bit outdated. I'm not going to be there. The style of things should be what I enjoy the most. People need to take the initiative to reach out to me. Some of these, there's some truths in them. Or lastly, I expect people to serve me the way I want to be served. I shared this this morning in our prayer huddle, and I, I just want to share it again because I had this thought last night before going to bed um, that, that I'm going to be stepping on your toes. You probably already feel me stepping on your toes. Yeah, the cat's nodding your head. Um, but that, that should happen because if we're, our toes are never stepped on in the church, then we're probably just not listening. Um, unless the pastor is really not taking any, talking about any truth, we're probably not listening because my toes are stepped on saying these things. I'm stepping on my own toes if that's physically possible. I'm stepping on my own toes. I feel convicted. I feel challenged by this. And hopefully we all would, but we would have open ears, not a closed heart when it comes to this. Now, I want to say this about these desires before you just feel like, man, this is such a downer. I want to say that these come from our natural desire to be known, loved, seen, cared for, and valued. 
So I understand, I have the um, tension to deal with that hopefully we have the perspective that these desires to be served and seen and have best friends, they're not inherently bad desires. They come from good places. The issue really isn't that the desires are inherently wrong. Some of them are, they're selfish. The, inher- the, the issue is that we map them onto the Christian community and make them a law that we, that we go to evaluate other people and communities by them. They're good feelings and desires, some of them, but they're not supposed to be designed to be mapped onto our interactions. Now, however, they are good, but however, I wanted to say this, tuck your toes in. I think we're really making the church about us if we hold on to those expectations. And this just needs to be said over and over again, because again, our propensity of our flesh is to what? Make life about us and not God. We're judging things based on how they make us feel, how they serve us, how well they meet our expectations, and how they fit with our personalities and preferences. How do I know that? Because I do this, and I've heard you, you do this. This is natural. We, We judge things based on how they make us feel, how they fit with our values and our priorities. And while that is um, understandable, I understand where that comes from, uh, it is not justified in the scriptures. We don't want to enter into community with that kind of perspective. Here's just why this matters before we go into another question with the scripture. Um, Like I said earlier, people, because of this, they start to become discontent. I've seen this pattern kind of play out where there's discontentment that leads to emotionally checking out. So maybe you're like, I'm... I'm feeling kind of like discontent. This is not the way I thought things would be in my small group, my internet, my interaction. I want to, uh, but then the we emotionally check out. So like we're physically at the church or at the small group or at the the event or at the relationship or the house, but we're emotionally not there. That's probably even more dangerous than us leaving because we we're fooling ourselves into thinking we're there and we're not. And then we start to distance ourselves. And I've seen this play out so so often where discontentment leads to checking out, leads to distancing themselves. I'm not going to come around as much with these people. I'm not going to answer texts. Not going to reply. And then people end up leaving churches and Jesus. Now that's all a negative aspect, a negative consequence. Here's a positive consequence, or a different way of saying it. Ultimately, we miss out on what could be as a gospel community. I'm worried about people being discontent and emotionally checking out and distancing and leaving. That's why we have shepherding conversations and, we, and you, you know who you are. We've talked to you if you thought about leaving or you had a bad experience. We, we, we deal with that. We, we talk to people about that. And we need to be able to share our experiences and our opinions and where we're feeling, what we're feeling. But ultimately, my heart breaks because we're missing out on what could be. On this side of heaven, still broken, what could be as a beautiful expression like Tom said, of heaven on earth. Broken as it still may be, beautiful. And there are experiences that I've had in this church um, that have tasted like heaven because of relationships, because of the gospel community. Now the question we need to ask then is this. What does Jesus call us to as followers and his family? That's the really only question that matters. The question that doesn't matter is, but what about my expectations and, and what do and, and what about what I think about it? The question cannot start with us. It has to go with Jesus if we are following him. The idea of being an apprentice of Jesus is that we would follow his way, that we would look like him and live like him. So we want to do things the way Jesus says to do. Maybe a different question. What expectations should we enter into community with? I'm entering into a church and hopefully... If, if you don't last here forever and you, God moves to a different place or something happens, different job or home, you would take this into your next church. It would be a what expectation. Before you enter in, let me just make a pre-commitment in my mind to the Lord and the Holy Spirit and to these people that I'm going to expect something that's biblical and realistic and not unrealistic. Biblical and realistic, not unrealistic. If you have a Bible, you can turn to John 13. John 13, it's just a small passage inside there, but I want us to spend a few moments thinking through this. You might know the passage is very, very uh, familiar and famous to a lot of us. You read your Bible. The context is really simple. Um, it's end of Jesus' life and ministry, and he is uh, in a home at the feast of Passover washing the disciples' feet. He's serving them right before he's betrayed by Judas. 
end of his life. And he says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, before you think, okay, I'm tuning out. We're talking about love. I know that. Love, love, love. I get that. We're supposed to love one another. Uh, when we stop at the word love, it's not enough. Because we can define love a lot of different ways. And because of who we are and our experiences, we have a tendency, if not checked by the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, to define love how we want to define love so that it's comfortable and convenient to me. This is how love works out to be. But if you look at the scriptures, you know, next slide, Rue, you notice that Jesus, uh, he focuses on the love for the other. He's saying, I want your love to be other-focused. This is not self-love. He cares about you, and we're going to talk about that. This is about love for the other. And notice how Jesus says, he says, uh, just as I have loved you. What does that mean? We do not get to define what love looks like. Jesus defines what love looks like and hands it to us and says, this is the way. This is the way. As followers of Jesus, we follow his model. And this is so beautiful. Because Jesus defines it. And he says, the way that I want you to love your neighbor and interact with them is the exact same way I have loved you. So, simple, logical question. What did Jesus do to love us? How did Jesus love us? And what ways has Jesus loved us? Because if we understand that, if we understand how Jesus has loved us, not just the generic, he loved me, so I generically love my neighbor, but he specifically loved me in this way, and so I specifically love my neighbor in these ways. See, generalities keep us from accountability. When we're general about love, someone needs to write that down. I need to write that down. Uh, I need to remember that. Generalities keep us from accountability. Because when we say love, we're freed up to en enter into our own definition, and no one keeps us accountable because it's love. But when we make it specific and define it on Jesus' terms, then you don't have the freedom to move around doing whatever you want. You are tethered to the accountability of obeying the way of Jesus. And let me tell you, the way of Jesus, though it might be hard, it is the best for your life. It's the best for you. It's the best for your flourishing, the best for your joy, the best for your peace, the best for your emotions, the best for your mental health, the best for your body. He created you. He knows what's best for you. It's the best for you. So how did Jesus love us? Philippians 2 gives us a very clear picture of that. Paul says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Wow. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He what humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and even death on a cross. Jesus, you can go to the next summary slide. Jesus, this is so wild. This is the Son of God. God made flesh. And what did God do in Christ? He didn't look to his own interests, but to ours. Jesus had every right to look at his own interests because he deserves all worship. We sang it. He's worthy of all praise, of all obedience. And yet the Son of God, who's worthy of all obedience, humbled himself. And like Philippians says, did not look to his own interests, but look to the interest of us. He did not grasp onto his rights and privileges. It says in that verse that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's a right that he had, and he didn't use his God card in the way that he could have to trump people, to keep himself from, from danger, to keep himself from being let down, to keep himself from the cross. He didn't use it. He let it go, and he humbled himself to the form of a servant. His whole life and ministry was spent serving others. That context of love one another, he's washing his disciples' 
feats. I don't know if we understand that fully. I, my, my mind can't comprehend that the God of this universe who in Exodus was so holy that people couldn't go to the mountain because they would be burned because of his holiness. Now that God in flesh is washing disciples' feet. That is the God we're talking about. He humbled himself that much. He didn't exalt himself but chose a humble death. What does all this mean? That Jesus loved us in what way? Sacrificially. If Jesus loved us this way, you can go back to, uh, yep. If Jesus loved us this way, I'm talking about this way, the sacrificial at great cost to himself, giving up what he could have kept. If Jesus loved us this way, and Jesus says, just as I have loved you, just as I do it, you need to do it. Copy me, exactly how I did it, you do it. In the primary way, we must relate to one another as the church is through sacrificial love. The primary way we relate to one another is through sacrificial love. And why is that so revolutionary? Because that is completely opposite than our natural bent to relate to one another. Like we shared earlier. The natural bent is what can people do for me? How can the church serve me? What can people do to help me? And that's a good, valid question. But it cannot be. The primary question, I said it this way, just thinking about our perspective. It's not wrong to look at your own interests and make sure you care for yourself. I want you to hear that from me. Because look at what he says at Philippians. He says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. He doesn't say, forget your own interests. It's balanced. He says, look not only to your own interests. So you need to care for yourself. But this is beautiful. Don't, he says it's not wrong to look at your own interests and make sure you care for yourself. It is wrong, though, to make your interest the prioritized and prevailing lens by which you evaluate the interaction in community. It is wrong to make my interests the law by which everyone is judged by. And if my interests are not met and prioritized, then there is a, there's a, something faulty with other things around me. That is not the way of Jesus, because Jesus says to count, what does he say? Count others as more significant than yourselves. That's a hard word for us today because the culture says the complete opposite of that. And there's not many things or people or places where you're hearing that you should look at someone. The Greek word literally means to count, to esteem someone as of more importance than you. It's not meaning they are more important. It means treat them as they're more important. It's not meaning you, you suck and they rule. It doesn't mean you de devalue yourself. It just says you give yourself value. You're made in the image of God. Your needs matter. But don't make them the ruling thing of your life. Someone else's needs matter more than yours. And here's what I want to say. If all of us enter into community with the question of what can the church do for me, then no one will be served. If all of us enter into community saying what can I do for my neighbor, then all of us will be served. See the difference? If we're all looking out for our own interests, then you won't get served. You won't get served, and you won't get served. And, but if everyone says, I care for me, and I'm making sure I'm healthy, but I'm thinking about someone else first, then, man, you'll get, you'll get served, and you'll get served. Why? Because everyone's thinking about the next person, not themselves. Jesus has made it so beautiful. Where your eyes are off of yourself, thinking about someone else, you end up getting served the way you need to. Now, I want to make some distinctions. I want to make some distinctions. When we talk about sacrifice and sacrificial love, it's important to understand the definition for what sacrifice is because we can, again, make love very general. This is a really uh, specific and important definition. Sacrifice means an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. What I want you to understand is sacrifice always involves a cost. Sacrifice always involves a cost cost. It is giving up something of value for the sake of something that you're esteeming is more valuable. And here's what I think we run into the problem with this idea. There's a distinction between giving something and sacrificing something. Track with me. Some of us are giving things that don't cost much to us. But Chris, I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving things. And Jesus would say, yes, thank you, but you're giving things still on your own terms. And Jesus doesn't say give things on your own terms. Some of us give money a way that we really don't miss. And we come to things that we're going to love and we know we're going to like. 
and we interact with people that we know we're not going to have a problem with. And Jesus would say, yes, I applaud that. But if you're going to act the way Jesus acted, then you give up things that are costly. And Jesus gave up his life. We give up our preferences. And so we say, I'm going to do things that aren't just convenient but costly. I'm going to give more money because it hurts. I'm going to come to those things that I don't always like. I'm going to talk to that person that isn't my best friend or doesn't see things the way I see them. Community breaks down if we're not understanding the difference between giving something and sacrificing something. If you ask me today, uh, Chris, could you give me a book, sacrifice a book? And this is going to out myself again like Pastor Alex said, but I'm a big Tolkien fan, Lord of the Rings. If you don't know it, read it so you can be saved. But the Lord of the Rings is good. And um, if you ask me to give yourself a book, I have a lot of books in my library that I can care less about, and I can give you 20 of them. But if you ask me to give away one of my collector's edition token a book, that's a uh, token book, it's a lot different. And see, it's funny, but look at, we can give a lot of something that we don't care about and we'll never touch the thing we really care about. So I don't want you to be fooled. I'm not fooled. I don't want you to be fooled by thinking, and just for example, money's easy. It's not just always about this. But we can give a lot of money to the church because it's easy because we have a lot of money and we're not even giving what what we really can. We're just giving it so we feel good and we we want to and it's good, but that kind of like gives us a layer of like, yeah, now I don't need to give anything else because I've done that. I'm not going to give up something that's really costly to me. Now, what could be so costly in our culture that we would not want to give it up? Did you read my notes? Because if not, the Holy Spirit is working really. The hardest thing for many of us to sacrifice in our pursuit of loving one another is our time. It's either stuffed with too many commitments or guarded with a strict fierceness. Let me just tell you as one of your pastors, as I talk through people, it's not personalities and the differences of people and backgrounds and experiences that usually break down the church or interaction of love between people. It's time. It's time. And the thing that I know that, that, that is beautiful is that God has given us each 24 hours. We just choose how we fill those 24 hours up. And this is not a guilt trip on people who work a lot or who have busy schedules or are doing things for their kids. That, 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 that's just the wrong way. It's the immature way to think about it. I'm not saying that that's wrong. We just want to have the Holy Spirit check our hearts on how we are evaluating our time. And is it convenience or is it costly how we view our time? Because here's what I know about the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus isn't fitting things in when they work the best for us, but being willing to give things up for the sake of our neighbor. So you can say, yeah, but Chris, I'm going to home church after. I go to prayer night once every couple weeks. Or maybe you would say, but I don't ever go to home church because Sundays are fiercely guarded. It's this time. Or prayer nights are, I just can't do it because of this. Or I can't disciple someone because of this. Or there's no way I can serve the homeless with Stephen because of that. I'm too, and we have all these excuses. Now, there might be really valid reasons, but sometimes we go to the things that we can fit in, but it never strikes us. What if we actually have to give something up? What if we're not talking about how to fit more church things in? What if we're talking about giving something up in your life to be able to serve and love your neighbor? If we're talking about sacrifice, then we're not saying squeeze more community things into your busy schedule. I'm asking you to give something up. And I'm not just asking you that because of me. Jesus is asking you. And let me make sure you're very clear on on where I'm going. I'm not asking you to give up more time because I frankly need it. You need it. Your neighbor needs it. In a way, I do need it. Not because I'm the pastor of this church, but because I'm a member of this church that needs you to be around so I can be discipled and encouraged by you. And your neighbor and the people who aren't here online, they need you to show up when you don't feel like it. Because if we always just gave our time and felt like I'm going to show up when I feel like it and it's convenient, people are not going to grow the way the Bible tells us we need to grow. And that's okay if you want to settle for a church like that. But let me just tell you, as long as I'm breathing in here, that's not going to be, it's not going to be the way we operate at the movement church. We will not operate with convenience, but with cost and sacrifice. Because I want to follow the way of Jesus because that's the path to the good life. And I am here today because people gave up their time to invest in me when it wasn't convenient. People answered calls and opened homes and came to me when it was hard, but they gave up things. And I'm not going to get to super specifics this week because next few weeks we'll be talking about some other specifics. 
And we'll talk about an, uh, something to do as an evaluation, maybe some practical homework you can do to think through things. But I, I just don't know if we're used to hearing someone say, you might have to cancel your sports team with your kid to do something. You might have to stop working at extra hours because you're looking for a bigger house. You might have to stop doing those extra things. I think Jesus is allowed to say those things to you. Maybe you're mad at me because I'm saying them. But I think Jesus would come to all of us and say, what if that's not the most important thing in your life? What if that's not the most fruitful thing you can be spending your time doing? No, but Chris, my, pa- my kids need to have an American life. They need to have sports and, this, and the academics. And the, but is that the way of Jesus or is that the way of the culture? Again, you have to figure out your own timing and say yes to things. This is not against those, those things. It's against those things becoming the thing that stops us from sacrificing for the main thing, which is the people of God and the mission of Jesus. And it doesn't mean that we can't be missional in our workplace, missional at a sports game. That's not what I'm saying. But I've just seen too many people, I'm just going to call it as it is because it's way easier to tell the truth and not, that in my life of pastoring over the last 10, 11 years, so many people use time as an excuse because they're doing what they want to do or think they're doing what they need to do and they, get, they miss out on what God has for them because what God has for you is going to be ultimately revealed through his people, his word and his people, the spirit in other people. You don't need me to tell you that because the Bible explains it all, that we are members of one another, interdependent. I need you to show up so you can build me up and vice versa. And when people don't, we lack something that can make us stronger. So the next season, just to give you a picture of why we're, why we're even talking about this, it fits in a couple of things. And this is going to be talked about even more next week in our membership meeting. Uh, but we've kind of retweaked membership because of this new transition and COVID kind of lost the emphasis on membership because we were just kind of at home. And so we've been retweaking that and praying and thinking through things. And, and we're going to be aligning membership to this call that I'm preaching on today. We're not aligning it to the fact that we're saying you can't be in sports or you can't work this job. We're not, we're not, we're, we're giving you the ultimatum to say you need to hold, you need to seek the Holy Spirit and you need to figure out what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you, and we want to help you with that. But the thing we are doing is calling people up to greater obedience and love, because that's the way of Jesus. It's the way of Jesus. This next season in the fall, we're going to be restarting groups and discipleship groups in a very different format than we've ever done it before. And actually, the way we're doing it is going to actually serve you, hopefully, the best, because uh, we are changing the frequency and the way that it goes about to honor your busy schedule, because we know the Bay Area is busy. But one of the things I want you to know, just up front before our next membership meeting, we're making groups and and discipleship groups a mandatory thing to be a member in this church because that's the easiest and and the most central way to interact with people in the church. And some of you might be like, well, I go to Sundays and that's enough. And I I want you to realize that right now you are not talking and encouraging one another. You're just hearing from me. And while this needs to happen, and I think teaching the word of God is primary and and discipling us and forming us, one of the other primary things as equal as that is the word of God being spoken to brothers and sisters, applied contextually to what you need in this moment. And that can't be done on a Sunday. It has to be done in homes and in coffee shops and on phone calls and through texts. Time. Time is the only thing, is is the environment by which discipleship grows. Jesus discipled the 12 disciples over three years nonstop. His model of discipleship wasn't a once a week thing or whenever they can come to his class, they could. He called them away from their life and called him to himself. I want to put before you, what is Jesus calling you away from? It's not going to work if you're trying to fit Jesus into your life. He's not another thing that you fit into your life. He's a thing that when he comes in, you get rid of things to fit him in because he's that big and that worth it. Can you imagine We're going to close up. Can you imagine a church that went from asking what can people do for me to what can I do for people? Can you imagine every time you come to Sunday, every time you come to a home church, every time you pray at night, every time you meet with someone at coffee or to their house or or bring them a meal, that you're saying to yourself every day, it happens to happen, it has to happen more than once. You have to keep on reminding yourself, it's not what can people do for me, but what can I do for them? Care for yourself. Take time off, Sabbath, journal, love yourself well so you're healthy. Those things need to happen. But the primary lens by which the people of Jesus are called to see life through is what can I do to love my neighbor? 
There's just no way around that as a follower of Jesus. And it's actually a very tiring thing to do. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot of things that I say yes to that I don't want to do. If you're never saying yes to things you don't want to do, then that's the, that's the question of are you following the, the Jesus of the Bible or the Jesus that we've created in America? Now, I want to end with this. I don't want to put this on us as law. I'd be like, man, this is heavy. How do I do this? There's one way this is going to work. A lot of ways it can flesh out, but one way. What can drive us to sacrifice like this? It's one of the most important questions we can ask. What can drive us to sacrifice like this? What can make someone who's so self-absorbed, not because you're evil or whatever, but because you've just been taught that, that the things revolve around you, or the culture says it's all about you and your heart and your dreams. So what can make a culture that embeds discipleship of self, how can we shift from that to sacrificing? What can do it for us? Look at this verse in Romans 12. I want you to stand with me, actually, as we read this. If you're able to. Do you read this with me on three? One, two, three. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, I want you to see a few important connections. He says, I urge you, plead with you, beg you to what? To present your body, your whole life, as a living sacrifice. But look at what he's building and pushing into this. He's saying that your ability to present your body as a living sacrifice is based on what? The mercies of God. I urge you. What do you have to urge? What are you urging me with? By the mercies of God to present your body as a living sacrifice. You have to know this comes 12 chapters into Romans. Do you know what Romans 1 through 11 is about? It is all about the mercies of God. And what Jesus has done to free us from sin and the flesh and the world and make us righteous and holy sons and daughters of the living God. Eleven chapters where there's almost no command or imperative. And then after eleven chapters of Paul saying, this is what God has done for you, the free gift of righteousness in Jesus. He says this, now, in light of all that, sacrifice your life for him. It would be different, and other religions would say, forget the first 11 chapters. You just need to do this, and then the 11 chapters will come. Then God will be merciful. But the difference of gospel is that the 11 chapters of mercy come before you're ever told to sacrifice your life. God has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. And then after he, he gives you the gift, he says, I want you to serve. And here's the kicker I want you to see. If you are staring at what you are losing when it comes to sacrificing time, money, words, whatever it is. If you're staring at what you are losing, you will never sacrifice for others. If you're going, no, I don't want to give this up. Look at the thing I love. Look at this time. Look at this thing, this comfort. Look at this. I don't want to give this up. If you're staring at what you're losing, you'll never be able to sacrifice. But here's what I know because it's true for me. It's true for you. If you're staring at what Jesus gave up to save you, you will have an endless supply of strength and motivation. You will, because of human nature, you will not want to give up what is precious to you if you're staring at what I'm going to lose. But if you take your eyes off church for a moment, that I'm not going to stare at what I'm losing. I'm going to stare at what I'm gaining in light of what Jesus has lost for me. Then it becomes easy. Now, is it hard? Yes, but it's easy as in it's simple. I know I need to do it. Why? Because Jesus is worthy of it. People need it. And he gave up so much for me. And what he's called me to do is give up a little for him. Not because he needs it, because he wants to bless us more with forgiveness. You have full forgiveness. This is not to earn things for Jesus. It is in response because you understand. I want to leave you with this. That the only way that you're able to give up things that are costly to you is that you constantly gaze and receive the gospel of Jesus for yourself. And I mean those words, constantly receive. If the gospel is, a, is an afterthought to community, if the, if the gospel is something you only remember once every couple of weeks, then you will have no motivation to be able to do the things that the gospel requires of you to do as an act of worship. 
Let me tell you, it is very hard for me to look at Jesus, the cross of Christ, and then look at what he's calling me to do and not say yes. So I want you to evaluate something really practical. Evaluate your schedule and commitments this week. Hopefully you have it written down on a calendar or somewhere. If you don't, I want you to take this seriously. We're trying to not hear the word, but do the word. Look at your schedule. There probably are things you cannot move, and that's okay. Don't feel guilt around that. And there probably are moments and times with things that you can move that you have to wonder, God, are you calling me to move this for the sake of others? And is my filling up my time at the expense of me loving my neighbor? He's not asking you to do what's easy and convenient. He's asking you to do what's hard and costly. It should hurt a little bit. It should sting a little bit. You should want to be like, no, I don't want to give that. But Jesus, but Jesus. Father, we, we need to look at you, Lord. We don't want to look anywhere else but the gospel of Jesus. To see that you are worthy of our praise, that you climbed up that cross as God of the universe climbed up the cross for sinners who've done nothing for you but marred your name. And yet in your humility and love, sacrificially gave up your life for people who would spit on you and curse you so that you would save them. What love what cost and Lord you ask us as our spiritual act of worship to give up something not because you need it but yes because our neighbor needs it Lord will we be a people in a church that says yes to you even though it's costly we will rejoice it is a joy to sacrifice for Jesus because he has sacrificed himself for me thank you Lord Refine us, sanctify us, encourage us, challenge us, empower us by your Holy Spirit, not our works and our strength, but by your Holy Spirit to do this hard thing. And may our church be better for it. May we grow into your likeness because of it. In Jesus' name, amen.